Governor Cuomo is giving an update on the coronavirus pandemic in New York. Let's go to it right now. Right, as you know, Secretary Melissa DeRosa to her right, Budget Director Robert Mejica. And since being Budget Director is not really a full-time job, it's basically one day a week, he's also on the MTA board and the CUNY board. That was a joke about being Budget Director. To my left uh, is the man of the day, Jan Lieber, uh, who uh, has been handling all the major construction projects for the MTA. Uh, and we're in Grand Central Terminal today, and we're going to go through uh, the largest transportation development in the country right now. Uh, and you're going to be the first to see it. Let's do a little uh, housekeeping business about today. I like to stress the point that uh, what we do today is going to determine tomorrow. This is a state in transition. It's a country in transition. It's a world in transition. What does the future hold? It depends on what you make the future. Uh, it's that simple. On the COVID numbers, all the arrows are in the right direction. They continue to be in the right direction. Positivity yesterday, 0.6, lowest since August 27th. So that's really great news. Uh, the number of hospitalizations is down to 1,200. That's great. Uh, uh, all the numbers are, all, are headed in the right direction. Uh, the one number that is always a point of reality that stops us from saying, well, COVID is a thing of the past. Uh, 10 people died yesterday from COVID. So uh, don't underestimate the power of this virus. Our number of vaccinations, uh, we're over 18 million. 64% have at least one dose, 55.8 fully vaccinated. We are now scratching for inches on increasing the vaccination numbers. The number of people coming in for vaccines is way down. So we're coming up with incentives and creative bonuses uh, and trying to knock down the excuses that people have or fears that people have about vaccinations. But we are literally, uh, when you talk about 64%, you look around the world, you don't have uh, many countries that get higher than that. So uh, this is really now, uh, we're in the red zone, uh, football analogy, every yard uh, we have to fight for, and we are fighting for. And that's what you see with all these incentives that we come up with and all these benefits that we come up with. Uh, and we're trying to knock down any obstacles to vaccinations. Kaiser Family Foundation just did a study that said 48% of people who are unvaccinated say that they may miss work from the side effects of the vaccine if it makes them feel sick. 64% of Hispanics, 55% African Americans. Uh, now, the side effects of the vaccine are very limited. Uh, I don't know anyone, frankly, who couldn't go to work the next day because of the side effects of the vaccine. But it is possible that you get mild flu-like symptoms. Uh, but it's not about the reality, it's about the perception. If you have 48% of the unvaccinated saying they're worried about missing work because of side effects, we want to address it. Department of Labor today is going to put out guidance to all employers in the state of New York. If someone has side effects and they take off a day, that by law will be considered a paid sick leave day. So they must get paid for any day that they need to recuperate from the side effects of uh, a vaccine. Again, I don't want to suggest that there are going to be side effects because it's relatively de minimis. But if that's an issue for you, that issue is resolved. You, you won't miss a day's pay because of uh, getting a vaccine. Also remember, we passed a law that says 
uh, the employer must give you four hours off paid to get a vaccination. If you get two vaccinations, they must give you four hours off per vaccination. So I understand the fears expressed in that study, but they're not reality-based. You get time off to get the dose. If you're one of the very few that happens to get uh, side effects from the vaccine, that's a paid sick day, so that won't cost you money either. Uh, and there are benefits to getting vaccinated. We have a whole host of benefits. Uh, the vaccines at the MTA hubs, where people get free passes, uh, have worked very well in some stations. It was an experiment never done before, but it's worked very well. We're going to continue it at Grand Central and at Penn Station for another week. Uh, also, the racing season is coming up, July 15th, opening day at Saratoga. Anyone who gets, uh, who is fully vaccinated uh, will get a free uh, admission, and that's opening up. So the COVID rates are going down, vaccine rates are going up. Uh, this is a period of New York rebirth. It is rebirth. It is what we make New York to be. And it's one of those moments in history where it is a character test. Uh, we went through hell. Yeah, we did. We got knocked on our rear end. Yeah, we did. Uh, so it asks us individually and collectively, what are you made of? And you got knocked down, but do you get up? And how do you get up? And who are you when you get up? What's a real New Yorker? There's an ongoing conflict in the Middle East, as we all know. Uh, but you can have your own opinion on the conflict in the Middle East. That's what you're entitled to. That is not an excuse for anti-Semitism towards anyone, period. Period. There are two separate concepts. You have a political opinion about the Middle East conflict, you're entitled to it. You express that through an anti-Semitic act, it's un-American, it violates New York's ethic, and it is illegal. It's all three of the above. Uh, I'm a, an Italian-American, born and bred New Yorker. You know why New York works? because we have a compact and a mutuality uh, of understanding. If anyone discriminates against me because I'm an Italian-American, I expect other New Yorkers to stand up and say, we don't tolerate that. When you discriminate against an Italian-American, when you discriminate against a Jewish person, and Hispanic, a black, you discriminate against every New Yorker because every New Yorker believes in that acceptance and that mutuality and that collegiality and that acceptance. Uh, we have no tolerance for anti-Semitism, period. No New Yorker has any tolerance for discrimination against any other New Yorker. And that's what makes New York special. Uh, we're going to provide additional state troopers to uh, Jewish communities and especially Jewish religious and educational facilities. And we're going to be affording priority protection during Shabbos uh, because, as you know, there has been a disturbing number of incidents. And I want our message to be very loud and clear. New Yorkers stand together in solidarity we have no tolerance for discrimination against anyone. Uh, and uh, that certainly applies to our Jewish brothers and sisters. Uh, it is personal, and it should be personal for every New Yorker. There is no New Yorker who doesn't have friends, family, uh, who are members of the Jewish community. Uh, my two brothers-in-law, my nieces uh, are Jewish. And it is personal for me, and it's personal for all of us. 
Uh, it's also illegal. Forget morality, ethics. It's illegal. And these attacks against people who are Jewish because they're Jewish, or these attacks against Asians because they're Asians, they will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. It is illegal. They are hate crimes. We have one of the strongest hate crimes in, this, in the country, hate crimes laws. And I give you my word personally that those laws will be fully enforced. What does it mean to be a real New Yorker? It means when life knocks you down, you get up and you get up stronger. We've done it time and time again. Superstorm Sandy, we did it. 9-11, we did it. You had all sorts of naysayers after 9-11. Oh, we're not going to be able to recover. Yeah, those weren't the real New York voices. We, we got up and we got up stronger. Well, the city's going through a tough time. Yes, the city's going through a tough time. It's gone through tough times in the past. And we recovered and we came back stronger. New York City was bankrupt. Yes, we have a crime problem. Uh, we had a worse crime problem and we managed it. Uh, you just have to think big and get past it. So don't think about New York reopening. I talk to all these governors all day long and they say, we're reopening, reopening. I say, I'm not reopening my state. I'm reimagining my state. Reopening means we're gonna go back to where we were the day before COVID. There's no going back. New York doesn't go back. That was a year ago. We don't want to go back to where we were a year ago. We want to go ahead and we want to learn from what we went through and we want to reimagine what New York can be. And think big. You look at this, what made this city, what made this state was audacious ambition. I'm going to build the Empire State Building in the middle of the Great Depression. I'm going to build the longest bridges, longer than ever, Brooklyn Bridge, George Washington Bridge. Uh, we're going to build a reservoir system 60 miles to get water from the Mid-Hudson. It was built on thinking big. And that's what we need again. Think big. What's a big project to reinvigorate the economy? Uh, what's a big project where we can show New Yorkers, look at this. This is who we are and this is what we can do. Just walk through Moynihan Train Hall. I don't care if you don't get on a train. Just walk through it and it will remind you of who we are and what we can do when we get out of this uh, state of paralysis uh, and political pedantics and saying no to everything building a new Penn Station after how many years about talking about it, a new Port Authority bus terminal. How many years have we said this is a disgrace, but nobody did anything? Uh, new Pier 76, just another symbol of showing you don't have to dwell in apathy and incompetence. You can actually make something happen. New Belmont Arena, the largest green infrastructure program in the United States of America. What's the key to reimagining? First, public safety. Public safety, public safety, public safety, crime, crime, crime. All these people who are running for mayor, my two cents to New Yorkers, you're going to pick a New York, a new mayor? A mayor who can deal with crime realistically. Open up offices, open up businesses, reopen the city. Not unless people believe it's safe. Reopen the subways, not unless people believe it's safe. And this is not just a conceptual discussion. How do you do it? What would you do? Would you put a cop on every train? Would you put a cop in every station on the subways? We need change. What would you do with the bail reform laws if you think we need change? How do you build trust with the community once again? How do you do it? New York City just did a police reform plan, just passed by the city council. It was nice, it was helpful, but it was incremental at best. There is no incremental solution. 
and transit. And that's what we're here to talk about today. What made New York City and New York State was the transportation network that we built. Bold, audacious, and we did it. New York City region is the economic driver, right? It's not Manhattan, it's not Queens, it's the New York City region. And the New York City region is New York City, Long Island, northern suburbs, part of Jersey, part of Connecticut. That's the New York City economy. That's what makes this city work. It's not just people who live in Manhattan. I lived in a faraway place called Queens. People in that faraway place called Queens went to Manhattan. There's a, another faraway place called Long Island. That's part of the New York City economy. Westchester, Rockland, Orange, parts of Connecticut, parts of Jersey. They're all part of the New York City economy. And getting them in and out determines how successful you are going to be. You want to talk about audacious and bold. Long Island Railroad, going out to the tip of Long Island, which they built to reach a ferry. That's why they built the Long Island Railroad, to get out to take a ferry to Boston. But what the Long Island Railroad did was it opened up Long Island. And you had two generations ago, people left Brooklyn, left Queens, they went out to Long Island. There were 37,000 people on Long Island. Today there's 2.8 million people. Well, they live on Long Island. Yes, but they are part of the New York City economic region. And they're coming into New York City. And people in New York City are going to Long Island. It is the region that works. East Side Access is the biggest transportation project being implemented in North America today. It was an audacious idea, an $11 billion project connecting Long Island Railroad to Grand Central Station, but more changing the entire regional transportation system. You have Grand Central which goes down, call it two, two floors. East side access is three stories below the existing Grand Central two stories. That's the concept. We're going to build new concourses beneath the existing Grand Central concourses. Four new levels, four passenger platforms, capacity for eight trains at a time, 24 trains per hour, underneath Grand Central. Not just underneath Grand Central. This goes from Grand Central, 42nd Street, to 49th Street. It is an underground development that goes seven or eight blocks underground. Just imagine that. There is no other terminal that does that. We're going to build underground central, and then we're going to build north, seven, eight blocks north underneath at that level. Amazing. Customers will come in, they arrive at a 350,000 square foot concourse. The trains to do this have to transfer in Queens through what's called the Harold Interlocking. Don't ask me why they call it the Harold Interlocking. Somebody here will probably know the answer, but I don't. But the Harold Interlocking is the largest train intersection uh, in the Northeast, certainly, and uh, one of the highest volume of trains go through Harold Interlocking in Queens. So the idea is the trains, trains from Long Island would change tracks at the Harold Interlocking, and there's a set of tracks that then go from Queens through a new tunnel under the river 
and into Grand Central Terminal. This is Harold Interlocking. To do it, Harold Interlocking needed $1 billion in improvement. In truth, it needed improvement anyway, because it was so busy and so outdated. But $1 billion of improvements to allow the trains to transfer at that point to come to Grand Central. Today we're announcing all the major construction is complete. Harold interlocking, the tunnels coming from Queens, the concourses at Grand Central, all the construction is complete. Uh, we still have some systems work to do, electrical systems, et cetera, but all the construction is complete. It's going to open up next year. It brings double the number of LIR trains into Manhattan. It means you can come into the east side of Manhattan as opposed to going to Penn and then having to come all the way back to the east side. It reduces the commute time by 40 minutes. You now have two stations that you can go into. When you put the east side access together with what we're doing on the Long Island Railroad, second track and third track, and new stations, it is redesigning the entire Long Island Railroad experience, which is very important because Long Island is part of this economy and making that commute work is vitally important. It also opened up a new train storage yard where we can save, store 300 trains midday. So you don't have to block tracks with train storage, which is what has been happening. But it's not just here at Grand Central. It reduces dramatically the number of trains going into Penn, which, first of all, is a good thing because uh, Grand Central is a much more pleasant experience than Penn right now until we do the new Penn. But reducing the number of trains going into Penn is very important because one of the major problems we have at Penn is we don't have enough track capacity. We don't have enough track capacity for Amtrak and Metro North as it is. Once you pull out the Long Island Railroad trains, you're going to build more capacity for other trains to come in to Penn Station. It will also allow JFK, you can get to JFK from Grand Central in 40 minutes, which will be a totally different way to get to JFK. And remember, we're in the midst of rebuilding JFK. So just like LaGuardia, we're rebuilding LaGuardia with a train to get to LaGuardia. Now you have a train to get to JFK in 40 minutes. Uh, and what we're doing at Harold Interlocking, it's not just New York City, it's the tri-state area, it's going to be the whole Northeast. The universal formula for success, you know what it is? Applies to any occupation. It is come up with a great idea. Step two, do it. One caveat, step two is hard. This was very hard. Uh, building nine blocks under the Grand Central, uh, hundreds of feet below the surface was hard. Building a new tunnel was hard. So it's in the doing, right? Uh, it's in the doing. I have a great idea. Let's build a new airport at LaGuardia. Great idea. Yeah, now do it. Uh, I have a great idea. Let's rebuild JFK. Good, now do it. I have a great idea. Let's build a new Tappan Zee Bridge. It's falling down. They've talked about it for 20 years. Okay, now do it. I have a great idea. New Penn Station. It's a hellhole. Yeah, okay, now do it. Uh, east side access, great idea, now do it. And the problem is in the doing. And I wanna thank uh, the team that has done this. This, I've been through a lot of difficult projects. Building a bridge is difficult. Building an airport is difficult. Uh, this was probably the most difficult project to get accomplished. Uh, there have been 
dozens and dozens of meetings that I have uh, participated in, hundreds of meetings, uh, contentious meetings, uh, hard meetings, uh, but like anything else, you want to get that stone to the top of the hill. It's hard. Uh, but I first want to recognize Jano Lieber. Uh, Jano has done an extraordinary job here. Uh, Jano, I've watched and admired for many years. He's not as young as he looks, Jano, you know. Jano worked for Ed Koch. He uh, looks amazingly young. That's because he has very few miles on him. His very low stress job Jano has. Uh, I worked with Jano in the Clinton administration where he was in federal DOT. Uh, and then he came to the MTA and he took on all these projects that were stuck in the quagmire. A lot of, it's very often that a government project, people almost just give up on it. It's too complex, it's too hard and it just goes on forever. But nobody even thinks about completion. I'll walk into meetings on, on government projects and I'll say, when do we finish? Well, we don't know. How do you not know? Well, we don't know. We have issues, we have problems. Uh, Jano has taken this project and others, L train, et cetera, uh, and just made it happen. And, and gotten it done. He also has a great team who's with him. You'll be meeting some of them today, but I want to recognize uh, Rob Troop and uh, Judith Conover, Conoff, uh, David Puza, Tim Mormon, Michael Pujak, Emil Patel, Kim Trevian, and Dennis Ferrer. Uh, also, Erica Heckman, Paige Biacamano, Mariam Khalil, Ashley Hanrahan. They're going to be with us on the tour. Uh, this is probably not only the largest in the country, but probably the single most ambitious and the most uh, difficult. Uh, we're going to show you a quick four-minute video that's going to give you an idea. We're then going to take a tour of the uh, concourse level. There will be a tour of the new tunnels that Jano's going to do. Uh, I've done that a number of times. Michael Aronson will enjoy that tour because he is a tunnel construction aficionado and he's going to see racked cables along the tunnel walls and it is going to make his day. <laughs> uh, but the tunnels uh, go from here to Queens. And uh, there, it's a totally different type of construction, and it's quite an elaborate uh, situation. Uh, last point, last time I did this uh, walking update uh, through the concourses and through the tunnels and into Harold Interlocking was with a gentleman uh, named Jim Dwyer, James Dwyer. And Jano and I did it uh, in the middle of the night one night. Uh, a reporter asked me once, uh, why don't you go into the subways? I said, no, no, when you go into the subways with politicians, it's for photo ops. Uh, I go in in the middle of the night when we're actually doing work and need to make decisions and get things done. But anyway, uh, must have been like one o'clock in the morning or something. Uh, Jim Dwyer, Jano, and myself uh, went from the Harold interlocking through the tunnels, this is about a year ago, uh, and then went through the concourses, and then we went over to Moynihan. Uh, and he, Jim Dwyer, for those of you who, who didn't have the pleasure, I mean, just an extraordinary journalist. Uh, an extraordinary journalist. He was at Newsday, he won Pulitzers, uh, and he passed away. But I was thinking of him today, and he said to me, uh, one of the things he said on the tour is, uh, this is amazing, nobody knows this is here, it's a whole city under the city. Uh, but can you ever get it done? Will you ever get it done? He went right to step two, do it. 
It seems we can't get anything done anymore in this city, is what Jim said. And Jim had a tremendous feel for New York City. He said, we feel like we can't get anything done anymore. Can you get it done? James, we're getting it done. We're getting it done. We got Moynihan done, and we're getting this done. Let's show the video, and then we'll take some questions, and then we'll take a tour, and then people who want to go through the tunnel tour, which is about a half an hour to the Queen's side. Uh, Jano and his team will be doing that. East Side Access is the MTA's largest capital project, with work spanning three boroughs and extending deep below Park Avenue in Manhattan. The project will deliver for LIRR customers a brand new terminal and concourse beneath Grand Central, nearly eight city blocks long, eight miles of tunneling, 40 miles of new tracks, and the modernization of Herald Interlocking, the busiest intersection of passenger train lines in North America. East Side Access will deliver faster commutes, fewer delays, greater reliability, and more options for passengers. Long Island Railroad riders will now have faster, direct access to the east side of Manhattan, easing overcrowding in and around Penn Station. The project is also expanding and strengthening our regional rail network, protecting us from future transportation crises. East Side Access is the first expansion of the Long Island Railroad in more than 100 years. When the railroad was first built, 37,000 people lived on Long Island. We now have 2.8 million residents. To support that growing population, all 11 lines of the Long Island Railroad will now connect to Grand Central Terminal as well as Penn Station, saving commuters to Manhattan's east side up to 40 minutes of travel time per day adding up to 10 days per year. With roughly half of Long Island commuters expected to go to Grand Central, there will be less crowding at Penn Station and on surrounding subway lines. East Side Access will create faster connections to JFK Airport, getting you from Grand Central to your terminal in roughly 40 minutes. And along with the construction of the third track and double track projects in Nassau and Suffolk counties, East Side Access will ensure we can meet the demands of Long Island's future population growth. Long Islanders will be able to take full advantage of the job growth around Grand Central Terminal in the wake of the East Midtown rezoning. Better reverse commuting options from New York City to Long Island will expand job opportunities for New York City residents and help Long Island businesses attract skilled workers, strengthening the island's economic health and future prosperity. Then there's the brand new Long Island Railroad Concourse and Terminal, built directly below Grand Central Terminal and Park Avenue. The new 1,000 foot long terminal can accommodate eight trains at a time, enabling service for up to 24 trains during peak hours. Passengers will have easy access to Long Island Railroad through multiple entrances along Madison Avenue from 42nd Street to 48th, and many more within Grand Central itself. There will be cellular and Wi-Fi coverage throughout the terminal, and all digital signage will provide real-time information about train departures. Overall, this new destination includes 350,000 square feet of new space, including 25 retail storefronts and space for pop-up shops to meet the needs of daily commuters. A critical piece of our transportation system is Herald Interlocking. Built over 100 years ago, it is the busiest intersection of passenger train lines in North America. With nearly 800 trains passing through each day, the potential for congestion and delays is significant, impacting daily commuters. So East Side Access is modernizing and transforming Herald to eliminate that congestion and reduce delays. Over $1 billion is being invested to make sure that you have a faster and more reliable commute now and in the future. This ambitious and transformational project for Long Island Railroad and the region's future is slated to open 2022. East Side Access will make our regional transit system faster, more resilient, more connected, and more reliable for our future. Okay, to sum it up, uh, this will have a regional effect. It'll affect Grand Central. It'll affect Penn. 
we saw when we opened the Second Avenue subway up to 96th Street, how it changed dramatically. Transit drives the economy. Transit drives the economy. Uh, and especially at this pivotal time for New York, where New Yorkers are saying in their own way, uh, is New York going to be New York again? They see all these issues post-COVID. They see crime. They hear all this doubting. Can New York do it? It's Jim Dwyer's question. Can you do it? New York can do it. We can do anything we set our mind to. And by the way, we are doing it. This is not a plan. It's not a proposal. We are doing it. It's hard evidence. It's concrete. Uh, so have faith in New York. We did it before. We're doing it again. Let's take some questions, and then we'll go on to it. Why can't we move MSG to build a better Penn Station? We don't own it. It's big. It's hard to hold. Madison Square Garden, it's hard to pick up. Uh, they just invested uh, over a billion dollars in it, and it's a privately owned property. So you would have to uh, have the uh, consent of the garden owner. You would need a place to put it, because that's the franchises also play there, right? And that's a big piece of real estate, and then you'd have to pay for it. Are you going to bring another? Have you talked to him about it enough? Yes. What's he said? Hey, who's going to pay me? Where are we going to put it? He can't pay for it? He can't pay for it? No. Yeah, but he just put it in the garden. He just spent a billion dollars with the garden. He likes it where it is. He's fine from the garden's point of view, right? Governor, you're doubling capacity, right? So the idea is you have every work trains coming in. I mean, I know this project was planned a long time ago, was certainly built on the assumption that Midtown would come back with the same kind of traffic it had prior to the pandemic. Does that affect the thinking at all? In other words, is it possible there are going to be that many fewer people commuting into Midtown in the future? Zach, there can't be. There can't be. You're talking about a diminished New York. Maybe people won't come back. I don't accept that premise. I don't believe it. I don't accept it. Well, what do you promote? I mean, not necessarily, you know, remotely. It doesn't necessarily mean they need to be an office space in Midtown. The question is a good one, because you're asking, post-COVID, what will the economic dynamics be? Will people continue to work from home, fewer people coming into the office? And what I'm saying is, I think in large part, we don't know. And in large part, it depends on what we do. It depends on what we do. Now. If you're on Long Island now, do you work from home? If, you're, if you say, I have to get on that Long Island Railroad, it's going to be late, there's going to be a problem to Harold interlocking, then I have to go through Penn, it's a horrendous experience, that's one frame of mind. I want people to want to come to New York, right? That's what made New York New York. You didn't have to come here. I want to come. I want to go see the Knicks. I want to go to a restaurant. I want to see a play. People like people. A remote work. Yeah, you sit at home in your little uh, cocoon and uh, you deal with your family and your wife and the kids running around. Yeah, that's uh, good for a certain period of time, but people like people. People like socialization. Businesses like to sit around the table and bounce ideas off each other. Uh, just make it possible and make it attractive. That's what this is all about. Would this affect their structure in any way, or would you entice more people to come into the city with a different kind of fare? That is a very good question, Juliet. See, those Queens College people also ask good questions. Are you thinking of any fair there's structure? A, there's again? A, <laughs> Governor, there's a, there's a pilot underway that is actually uh, purposed at testing whether incentives for New York City residents in Queens uh, to, to use the Long Island Railroad more frequently for city residents to get discounts on the weekend, and especially for folks who are using the Atlantic branch to come through that, which has a little more capacity than the existing branches. So there is a real effort underway at the MTA to explore those types of discounts to entice people to, uh, to, come, to come back to New York. Ultimately, that's an MTA board decision, but that process is underway. Governor, 
for this tunnel along the second avenue subway the 63rd street f train tunnel was authorized in 1969 through transportation bonds given to the issue by the mta to 53 years um, should we expect should new yorkers expect 50 years before another infrastructure or rail project like this is complete again i don't know how long did it take me to build the uh tappan zee bridge largest infrastructure project in the united states Four years. Next question. You, you talked about uh, one of the benefits of the project being a freeing up capacity at Penn Station, but your plan is to go ahead and develop all that capacity by connecting that to north of Penn Station. So if you talk about that, especially for Long Island, the uh, railroad commuter two will continue using Penn Station and uh, will we'll have, could have the same conditions as they ever have, uh, especially with the new uh, railroad moving in. Yeah. Uh, Let's, let's see the full picture, and Jana will fill in uh, Mr. Castillo. You have, if you're on the Long Island Railroad now, you can only go to Penn. This says you can go to Penn or you can go to Grand Central. Reduces the number of trains to Penn, opens up capacity. When we talk about Penn, there are two totally different problems in Penn. One is the passenger experience, which is horrendous. And the systemic problem is you don't have enough tracks. That's why we are proposing buying the block south of Penn to build more tracks. If it was only the passenger experience, you can fix Penn. Now that you have Moynihan, you could take the people from in Penn, let them use Moynihan, and then rebuild Penn. That's if it's only a passenger experience. It's not just a passenger experience. You need more tracks, uh, especially if you're talking about uh, additional Hudson River tunnels to get more trains in. So freeing up tracks is a very big deal. What this will do is it will send fewer Long Island Railroad trains to Penn, freeing up tracks at Penn, which helps Metro North helps Amtrak, helps New Jersey Transit. So it frees up capacity at Penn, uh, as well as having an access point at Grand Central Station. And then what we plan is, yes, you'll have more capacity, but we want even more capacity, and that's why we want to buy the 780 block to add additional tracks, more transit, getting more people on more trains out of cars, coming into New York, in, in a pleasant circumstance, where you ride the train and you get out in Moynihan train station and you walk up and you look at that skylight and you say, what a beautiful day today is. And you look at the art or you get off in a concourse that you're about to see and you say, how beautiful is this? Uh, it's not an unpleasant uh, ride. Uh, it's not walking through this miserable condition um, because Zach is right. Uh, you're at a transition point in the economy. Maybe I'll just stay home. No, I want to go to New York. I want to see my friends. I want to go to dinner. I want to go to a play. But make it inviting. Don't make me run a gauntlet at seven o'clock in the morning just to get to work. You want to comment sure. on the well, I mean, Alfonso, just the math, the, the, the 24 trains an hour at the peak of the peak here, so a significant uptick in Long Island Railroad capacity in and out of Manhattan, number one. The, the Metro North uh, capacity on the Hellgate is going to be like four trains an hour. So there's plenty of incremental capacity for Long Island Railroad. And the other great benefit, which not everyone thinks about, but the governor does, is this is our gateway. This is, people talk about having a second way to get on and off Manhattan Island across the Hudson River. Long Islanders deserve a second route, next second railroad route on and off Manhattan Island, on and off Long Island uh, in the event of emergency. So this provides that backup capacity that Long Island with its almost three million people deserves at this stage of history. That's what this East Side Access Project does in addition to the extra capacity. And Mr. Castillo, put the pieces together. You know, we lay out the pieces incrementally. Uh, Grand Central Terminal, East Side Access, 
plus Penn, plus 780, plus Moynihan, plus second track, plus third track, plus station renovations on the Long Island Railroad. It's the totality that you have to see now. Mr. Aronson? Tomorrow, the Fed on Gateway, tomorrow the Fed and government are almost certainly going to advance Gateway uh, forward. Um, in the lessons that you've learned from Tap Z, from Deltrain, uh, and the problems that you've seen, a 60-year-old project that's cost $11 billion well before you, you got here, do you commit in your to insisting to the Fed's Amtrak Port Authority that Gateway which is $30 billion, it should be done as fast, as economical, as efficient as possible. And then after that, I'd like Jenna to address um, how New York will not get the full benefit of this 60-year-old project, $11 billion in, in price, when it opens because of the East River Tunnel situation, that this will actually be uh, a spare, a backup for a number of years, and how using innovative techniques, that could be avoided. So on the gateway and then on the spirit top. That Michael, he has very specific questions, and then he tells you who he wants to answer which one. <laughs> yeah, the, let me make it simple on gateway. Uh, gateway is very important. We've been talking about it for years. Uh, we pay 50% of gateway. It's not just my opinion to the feds, my advice to the feds. I'm not going to spend New Yorkers' money in a way that is not the most cost effective, cost efficient way. You know that because we had this fight with the MTA on the L train tunnel. And uh, I said the way they were doing the L train made no sense. And I brought in the best engineers, the best academics. We did a study. The MTA said, oh, you're suggesting an alternative to us. How dare you question the realm of the bureaucracy? And there are all sorts of stories. MTA says a governor interfering in the MTA's decision-making and the MTA knows better. The voices and the reinforcers of the bureaucracy, I call it. And the bureaucracy proliferates itself and has supporters of the bureaucracy. They feed stories to reporters. So the reporters reinforce the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy reinforces itself, perpetuates itself. It's hard to take on the bureaucracy. but. In the gateway, we have to pay. And I'm not going to pay unless it is a smart, efficient, effective process, period. And if the federal government wants to do stupid, they can do stupid with their money. But we're not going to do stupid with our money. So, so, Michael, you and I have had this conversation. I'm not going to go on. Uh, a tangent, but but obviously, my team did the L train. We believe that there are ways to repair the tunnels in place simpler and more efficiently, and we're advocating to Amtrak, who owns the Hudson River tunnels, to embrace those strategies, and we're pushing hard. You know that. But what does that mean about the East Side Access? When it opens, will it be at the full benefit for New Yorkers? or will not be a full benefit. Uh, uh, Michael, we're, we're, what we're talking about here is 24 trains an hour. That is like a, you know, a 60% increase over the capacity. Long Islanders are going to see significant improvement. We're going to continue to press Amtrak to do the East River tunnels in a way that impacts minimally on New Yorkers. But New Yorkers are going to see improvement from this project day one. But, and also, Michael, remember the, the full scope here, right? Uh, we build the Moynihan. The original plan was New York State builds Moynihan, Amtrak moves into Moynihan, and Long Island Railroad stays in Penn. That's the plan I inherited. We said, no way. Why would we build Moynihan, Amtrak riders move into Moynihan, 
but Long Island Railroad stays in Penn. We reverse that. We're now talking about rebuilding Penn, building, buying the 780 block, buying a square city block. Just think of that. Building new tracks and a new terminal under 780. That all benefits Amtrak. That all benefits Amtrak. Unless they don't want to go into our new station, or if they want to have one track going into our new station. So there are a lot of pieces on the board. All those renovations at Harold Interlocking, you know who that helped? Amtrak. You know who paid? We did. Uh, now, who owns Amtrak? Federal government. That did not do much good for us over the past four years with President Trump, uh, because President Trump didn't do much good for New York, period. But there is a different reality, and I'm telling Amtrak today, and I'm telling our federal officials today, we expect a fair deal with the federal government and Amtrak. Uh, don't expect New Yorkers to have fixed Harold Interlocking, pay for Moynihan, invest heavily in rebuilding Penn, which is owned by Amtrak, build a new station on 780 without them actually stepping up and fulfilling what has been their delinquent role in New York. They have been delinquent in New York. I believe that and they are federally owned, and the federal government is responsible for Amtrak. So let Senator Gillibrand and Senator Schumer and the new DOT commissioner, uh, federal DOT secretary know, uh, we're not gonna get the short end of the stick anymore. This is not the Trump administration, and we're not getting the short end of the stick. I had to agree on Gateway. They would not do Gateway unless we agreed to put state money in. They basically extorted us. So we had to do 50% state money, 25 New York, 25 New Jersey. Uh, that should have been federal money. Who's coming through the new gateway? It's Amtrak. It's Amtrak and a few New Jersey transit trains. Why should New York have paid for gateway? I don't have any trains going through gateway. Well, the trains are coming into New York City. Okay, so we were more than reasonable saying that we would pay 25% of the expense, but it has to be smart, and we go back to the L train tunnel, and I resisted the bureaucracy and the pettiness there, and I'm gonna do the same thing again with the Amtrak people saying, we know how to build a tunnel, we've been doing it all our life. What they leave out is the technology changed on how to build a tunnel, and we expect fairness from, uh, from Amtrak and the federal government. Let's take one more. Governor, We're going to get laid on time. Marsha Kramer. So, Governor, this is a long-delayed, over-budget project that still has a lot of work to do. I wonder if you're taking a gamble by announcing this announcement today that the, the Long Island uh, commuters have been waiting for this for a decade. If New Yorkers wanted a, an, a governor who uh, was not taking a risk and was not ambitious on their behalf, they wouldn't have elected me or reelected me. Uh, yes, uh, building this project is a risk. Building LaGuardia is a risk. Building JFK is a risk. Ba building the Mario Cuomo Bridge was a risk. It's all a risk. It's all a risk. This project I did not design, I inherited. And when we inherited it, it was basically dormant. Uh, just like Moynihan was basically dormant. Just like Tappan Z was basically dormant. They were just dormant, and they had to be resurrected. And I'll tell you something, it's harder to resurrect a project that you didn't start than to do uh, a clean slate, right? Mario Cuomo Bridge, 
largest infrastructure project in the United States, but it was a clean slate. I didn't have to clean up an existing mess. This one, we inherited a pit, literally, and we had to dig our way out. Let's take the tour before it gets too late. One other housekeeping. Should I wear a mask, should I not wear a mask? Here's the tricky one here. This is a public transportation facility where you have to wear a mask in a public transportation facility. However, it is not yet a public transportation facility. It is only a construction site. So it is somewhere in the gray area. It is a construction site that is building a public transportation facility, but it's not yet a public transportation facility. So it's up to you. If you're more comfortable, wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Let's take the tour. We can talk on the tour.